By 1557, the Ottoman Empire had reached its peak. The peak of its culture, its wealth, its leadership. Under Suleiman the Magnificent, it reached the greatest height that it ever could, at least without some sort of otherworldly assistance. Luckily for Suleiman, whose greatest wish was for the Ottomans to rule over not just the Middle East, but the entire world, that assistance came. On January the 1st, 1558, there was a blinding flash in Constantinople's Arasta Bazaar, and after it, there appeared an indescribable floating form, an envoy of an alien race known today only as the Rakish, the Dancers. From there, a group of bewildered Janissaries led it to Suleiman, who nervously asked its intentions. The Rakish explained that it came in peace and wished only for a tour of the beautiful Constantinople, for it looked like not much more than a speck of sand from high orbit. Suleiman was about as shell-shocked as you would expect, but still, he maintained his composure and offered to personally lead the alien through his city and return for many answers to his many questions. The Rakish agreed, and together they left the Sultan's palace to walk the streets of Constantinople. When asked of his religion, the Rakish replied that his people, who could step between constellations, worshipped an older, greater civilization who could step between galaxies. They were made of pure metal, like suits of armor, and were so large that even their smallest commoner stood taller than the highest earth mountain. They were called the Gaba Mamasta Babaka, meaning in Rakishi, the ones who stride between the real and unreal. But when Suleiman tried to repeat it and failed, he also offered a name that humans could better pronounce, Gobachi, which means shiny ones. When asked of his technology, the Rakish explained that in the ancient days, when the Gobachi faced extinction, they left behind great immeasurable clouds in space, made up of billions of tiny metal bugs no larger than a blood cell. The Rikishi Empire was founded upon these bugs, who, if manipulated properly, grant incredible powers to the manipulator, allowing them to teleport between stars, control minds, and conquer worlds. So, because of their importance, the Rikish called them Shas, meaning all. Then, the Rakish further explained that just as the human body is mostly water, the Rakish body was mostly shas. Then, they fell silent as Suleiman showed the Rakish every inch of his city, from the docks to the bazaars to the stadiums, the libraries, the universities, the mosques. The aliens seemed impressed, but still couldn't help but compare everything to the cities of his people, constantly pointing out where his race were advanced above humanity. Until he beheld the Grand Mosque, Aya Sophia, the greatest building in the world. Without hesitation, in the mosque Grand Hall, the Rakish proclaimed it the greatest building in the galaxy and then offered the sultan a single wish for anything in the universe. Instantly, without hesitation, Suleiman made his wish. Of course, it was for the Ottoman Empire to rule the world. The Rakish confirmed that this was easily possible, but when Suleiman asked if he could be given Shas to use its powers in war, the alien explained that it would take humanity many years of development to wield Shas. Instead, they would give the Ottomans Lashar, 
pink crystals composed of dead shots, which when touched with any thermal energy, even as small as a single spark, explode into lasers. Within weeks, Suleiman's personal army had their arquebuses and cannons fitted to load Lashar instead of gunpowder, an alternative that was lighter, easier to produce, and as would soon be proven, far more powerful. As soon as his army was deemed ready by the Rakish, Suleiman marched at once for Vienna, the bane of his career. And when he arrived, he unveiled Fafniri, a colossal Lashar cannon, named for the arch enemy of the German hero, Siegfried. When Fafniri was fired, its giant laser pulverized the Austrian defenses and continued completely through them to cut Vienna in half, leaving massive fires in its wake. The city surrendered just minutes afterward, confirming to Suleiman that he could do what was formerly thought impossible, all with just a single shot. Then, with the way to Europe left open, he easily conquered it, and from there, the rest of the world, so that by 1572, Nearly 15 years after the first Rakish entered Constantinople, Suleiman entered Kyoto at the height of Sengoku Jidai, and there named himself Shogun, in addition to hundreds of other titles. Then he ordered the Japanese imperial palace be hastily turned into a mosque, and when it was, he happily proclaimed it the furthest mosque from Istanbul, and died on a prayer rug. After Suleiman's death, it became immediately clear to Selim II, his successor, that the Ottoman Empire was actually worse off than it was before. Suleiman's conquest had been really more of a map painting exercise than an actual attempt to conquer and govern. So when Selim took the throne, he found that pretty much the entire world went untaxed and unadministered. Even the core territories of the Ottoman Empire were badly kept since Suleiman's armies had been away at war for so long. But, luckily for Selim, when he ascended to power, the Rakish gave him a single wish like his father, and he made it just as quickly. He wished for the Rakish to use their magic to help him administrate, since without it, this new worldwide empire would go down in flames. The Rakish agreed, but on one condition, that they be given rule over India to develop special members of its population to wield shahs, for they had found that Indians were the most physically gifted in its use. Salim easily agreed, and for six years rested on his father's laurels, as the Rakish used mind manipulation powers to develop in all the rulers of the world an inbuilt sense of loyalty to the Ottoman Empire, its leaders, and its culture. So that by 1578, pretty much every government in the world was effectively taxed 10% by the Ottoman Empire, with all the money going straight into Constantinople's coffers, easily making Sultan Selim II the richest man in history, without even lifting a finger. He wouldn't have long to enjoy it though, because three years later, in 1580, Selim and his favorite horse, Bucephalus, fell off a cliff while he vacationed in the Alps. But that wouldn't be the only grave news that shocked the empire that year, because just a week afterward, 
Salim's only heir, Murad III, also died in a horse riding accident when his horse, Honor, bucked him into the path of a column of Janissaries who were riding behind him on the way to Constantinople to claim the throne. These deaths couldn't have come at a worse time for the Ottomans, since one way or another, every male who could inherit the empire had died through various means. Meaning that after Murad's death, the Ottoman line was finished and the world's empire was left leaderless. When the Rakish used mind control to manipulate the people into loyalty, they had focused that loyalty specifically on the Ottoman line. So when that line ended, it left a power vacuum so immense that it threatened to engulf the world in flames. This left the Rakish no alternative but to take power themselves and use their magic to hold the strained empire together long enough to put a new sultan in power. So they chose the North Indian city Agra for their capital because they considered India the greatest place in the world. And even though they ruled the world, they were still loath to leave it. Then, they had to decide the process by which the new sultan would be chosen. They figured it would have to be a contest of intelligence that made the final decision. And since they spent so much time in India, the Rakish had become enamored with the popular Indian game, chess, believing it to be the purest show of intelligence in the world. So, they announced that in the year 1600, 20 years from 1580, they would hold a world chess tournament, with a single victor being crowned the ruler of Earth. Then, they went to every culture in the world and taught them the rules of chess, and told them what was at stake if they won. And after that, they returned to Agra to begin their 20-year rule, an era known as the Rakish Regency. Little is remembered of the Rakish Regency, because most of it was scrubbed from the history books, except for two great developments. The first being the Shah Smoker, a human trained from infancy to smoke a shuka, a special hookah modified to contain Shas and Delbaki, a spice from the planet Babu, which when mixed with Shas, puts the Shas to sleep, allowing the lungs to safely absorb it into the bloodstream without being torn apart, granting the Shah smoker many of the powers of the Rakish, and some of them, many more. And the second great development was the birth of Bisman al-Din Weishas, the second Muhammad, a man destined to rule not just the earth, but the entire galaxy. Bisman was born on January 31st, 1581, in Cairo, Egypt. Very little believable information is actually known of his early life, except that he was an orphan who begged in the streets for enough money to eat and to practice chess in the chess parlors, with the vague hope, like his countrymen, that he might one day win the world tournament, be named Sultan, and be free from poverty. The first time he actually shows up in legitimate historical records is when in 1596, at the age of 15, he competed in a regional chess tournament, which spanned the entire Middle East and North Africa, and placed 10th out of tens of thousands of participants. This was enough to get him noticed, and adopted by a wealthy merchant from Damascus named Beni Wadid, a kind man who allowed him to stay in his palace and be counted among his children. Together, 
Bisman and Benny Wadid traveled the Middle East, participating in every single chess tournament they could to hone Bisman's talent. So that in the regional tournament of 1597, Bisman placed 7th. And in the tournament of 1598, he placed 5th. But he wouldn't have much time to celebrate, because just as the 1598 tournament came to a close, Benny Wadid, the only father he had ever known, died of pneumonia. And his jealous son, Ali Wadid, took his place as the head of the family, disowning Bisman and leaving him at the age of 17, once again orphaned and homeless. As 1599 came around, Bisman was at his lowest point, forced to sell his belongings and beg as he had before. He was so depressed that he even lost confidence in chess and hardly played so that when the regional tournament of 1599 came, the final tournament before the world tournament, Bismond placed 197th, a far cry from 5th. That result dashed his hopes of ever becoming sultan, and since chess master who placed 197th wasn't a viable career path, Bismond decided to look for another occupation. But, late in 1599, just as Bismond started his training to become a pottery merchant, he saw his name on the list of Middle Easterners invited to Constantinople to participate in the World Chess Tournament. Needless to say, he quit his job. Then, he bought a camel and joined a merchant caravan to carry him to his destiny. Bismon and the caravan wouldn't actually make it to Constantinople until late December 1599, meaning that since he set out in early August, it took him nearly four months to arrive. And when he did, he looked far older and weathered by the journey. He literally had to go through an adventure to start his adventure, traveling non-stop for four months on Levantine roads filled to bursting with thousands of people on the same path as him and constantly being waylaid by bandits, robbers, and greedy officials, and by some accounts, even vampires. It was a series of events so epic that it alone spawned countless books and fireside tales, with one series, The Caravan Saga, being read by millions across the galaxy. You can only imagine while Bisman was on those roads that it felt like the whole world was bearing down on Constantinople, which for the most part was true. In order to accommodate the tens of thousands of chess players arriving from every corner of the earth, the Rakish had to evacuate the entire eastern side of Constantinople to make room. So instead of the familiar sights and sounds of Turks and Arabs that he expected, when Bismond arrived, he found the city streets flooded with the sights and sounds and smells of dozens of different cultures, each with dozens more differing languages, every one more alien to his ear than the last. The only thing that unified everyone was a universal love for chess and a rule set from the Rakish handed out at every entrance to the city in book form. Of course, to keep the city from falling into chaos, the first section of the book was on general conduct rules, which Bisman quickly skimmed over to the back where the actual rule set for the tournament could be found. There, it explained the tournament's structure, that there were two sections one upper and one lower, played simultaneously. The upper section, called the bracket, contained just 10% of the tournament's entrance, the ones ultimately expected to win it all. They played in a traditional style, 
with preset games and nice venues, with the only objective being to reach the top. And the lower section, containing the remaining 90% of players, was called the rabble. There, the only goal was to make it out into the bracket by amassing 10,000 points. The only problem being that every victory gave an inch and every loss took a mile, meaning that a player would have to play hundreds of games with barely any losses to even hope to escape. Then, at the bottom of the page, it said that on January 1st, 1600, the placements on the ladder would be chosen. And on January 2nd, the World Tournament would begin. So, Bismon spent the rest of December in a huge camp erected beneath the old remains of the Byzantine Hippodrome, waiting to be assigned his living quarters and told his position in the tournament. It wouldn't be until exactly January the 1st that Bismond was finally assigned a place to stay, and as he was led there, he was informed of his standing on the ladder, here, deep within the rabble, with just 3,000 points. Meaning, he would have to win practically non-stop hundreds upon hundreds of games to reach the bracket. Then, when he finally settled in the dirty loft they had assigned him, he was also informed that the rabble would be closed on June the 15th. So, if he wasn't out of it by then, he would be out of the entire tournament, along with 90% of its participants. Then, his guide left, leaving him with his thoughts. And there, in the dark surrounded by the empty furniture of an evicted family. He was the most anxious and lonely he had ever been. But, by the next morning, it would be impossible to tell Bismond couldn't sleep the night before because he threw himself into the game of chess, going to every street and every building to test his mettle against anyone who would play him, and even the ones who wouldn't. If they refused, he would cajole, insult, and when all else failed, even beg to make them play him. He was seen as a madman by the other players in the rabble, because in order to play so many games, he hardly ate, hardly slept, and hardly even spoke so that when he sat across from another player, he looked like a man possessed, held up by external forces, and playing for his life. But that wasn't the case. Bismond wasn't playing for his own life, but for the memory of Benny Wadid, his father, and everyone else who ever believed in him. And he was even prepared to die before he saw them disappointed. He even crossed cultural and class barriers to find opponents, fearlessly challenging people of far higher status than him, like a powerful French lord whom he mated in twenty, a great Mongol warrior whom he forced to angrily resign in twenty-three, a rich Venetian merchant whom he mated in twenty-five, and even a West African king whom, after a long game, he made it in 115. But in all the thousands of games he played, he lost hundreds, meaning that by the beginning of May, the second to last month before the rabble closed, he had just 8,850 points. So, he set about playing as perfectly as he could to squeak by into the bracket. But after 10 days of impeccable play, on May 10th, he was begged for a game by a 15-year-old Brazilian slave named Baltazar Costa, who for the entire tournament struggled to find willing opponents, and thus only had 300 points. As an act of kindness, Bismond accepted to play him, expecting an easy victory. But as the game got going, 
he realized the true skill of his opponent. And by the time he realized that, he noticed it was already too late. The boy had locked him in to a beautiful checkmate in 16. And because of this loss, Bismond learned the hard way, the most brutal rule of the tournament. If one loses to an opponent with far lower points than them, the winner gains far more points than normal, and the loser directly pays them. It's said that Bismond hardly ate and hardly slept before this, but now he pretty much never slept and never ate to be able to play as many games as humanly possible, so that in the next 29 days, he averaged 81.2 games a day. But he couldn't hold this schedule forever. Eventually, on June 12th, three days before June 15th, the lack of sleep and lack of food finally caught up to him. During a game with a relatively low-ranked opponent, he passed out at the board, and because the rule set stated that if someone falls unconscious or dies mid-game, as long as it isn't the fault of his opponent, he automatically loses. So Bismond awoke four hours later, with his score dropped from 9,500 to 8,900, with just two and a quarter days remaining before the rabble was closed. At this grim prospect, Bismond did as he always did, picked himself up and resolved to play even more games, so that for the next 50 hours, he played 291 games, back to back, leaving him just three hours before the rabble would be closed with 9,800 points. He could smell victory. And he knew that if he didn't drop a single game in those three hours, he could just scrape by at the last possible moment. Then, he sat down to play an Indian Sikh named Kumar, who was ranked far below him, with just 3,200 points. But as the game got going, Bismond realized by just move six, that he was completely outmatched. By move 13, his nerves made him blunder. By move 18, he was backed into a corner. And by move 25, he realized the game was completely unsalvageable. By this point, Bismond was so exhausted, mentally and physically, that he just sat back in his seat closed his eyes, and made peace with the fact that he would never be sultan. But just as he opened his eyes to announce his resignation, he saw, standing behind Kumar, a knife-wielding assassin, poised to kill his opponent. In an instant, despite knowing that if Kumar died, he would automatically win the game and save himself, Bismond leapt to his feet, threw Kumar and the chessboard aside and knocked the killer unconscious, saving Kumar's life. Then he announced his resignation. But to Bismond's surprise, Kumar didn't accept it, and instead, as a token of gratitude, offered a rematch. So, the two of them began what is called the Revelation Game because after Bismond achieved a hard-fought victory in 53 moves, the Sikh revealed that his name was not actually Kamar, but Janush. And he didn't have just 3,200 points, but instead 122,000. Then Janush fell to one knee and further explained that he was a Shaz smoker and the knife-wielding assassin was a magical projection designed to test the strength of Bismond's character. Then Janush offered to become his mentor for the rest of the tournament because he believed that someone as honorable as him truly deserved the title Sultan. 
Bismond had no choice but to accept. Now that he was in the bracket with fewer games, Bismond was finally able to sleep and eat. And since the games were slower, he had to rely less on pure instinct and more on planning and deep thought. So with Janush, a veritable human calculator, in his corner, he was unstoppable. But chess wasn't the only thing on Bismond's mind. In the short space of time between practicing and playing, he was also learning. Janush was beloved by Shas, and so he told Bismond of the visions, both awesome and terrible, it had shown him. At first, he started light, telling tales of the myriad creatures which walked the earth long before humanity, the nine planets which whirled about the sun, and the billions of stars beyond them. But when Bismond pressed him to go deeper, Janush told him things so unfathomable that if Bismond's subconscious didn't immediately reject them, his mind would be bent to madness. So when Bismond shied away, Janush stayed light, teaching him the arts, sciences, histories, and politics of the world. So that by the end of November, not only was Bismond a chess master, but he was also completely mentally and physically prepared to bear the title Sultan. Now, he just needed to realize it. With the final month, came the final bracket, which contained just 64 players. And with the bracket came 64 invitations to the Hagia Sophia, where the final leg of the tournament would be played in front of massive crowds. In a letter to his family doctor dated 1615, Benjamin Warwick, a printer from London, wrote of the experience describing it like a war veteran. The pressure was such like a boil in want of excise, or a head that suffered a hard knock. With every move, the crowds roared enough to burst the ears, and with every mistake came devilish derision from all parties. The wear upon my mind was such that when I was among the first to fall, I praised God that it was so, and that I could be home. And even now, as an old man far removed from play, I still grow deathly pale at the thought of it. But Bisman was different. He flourished under pressure. But as the bracket wore on toward the end, and the tension rose to its height, even as the size of the crowds grew, they grew more quiet, to the point Whereas Bismond entered his fourth set of the bracket, you could hear a pin drop across the entire city. Each game became so important that an entire network of messengers was established who ran themselves ragged to spread the word of each result. And here was where out of the entire tournament, Bismond felt the most pressure. But still, he had Janush, who, with a quiet wisdom born from countless walks into realms of the unknown, kept him calm and focused. So despite his anxiety, Bismond destroyed his next opponent, winning his fourth set in just six games. But he couldn't possibly celebrate, because just as he stepped off the stage, he was informed that his worst fear had been realized his next opponent was none other than Janush himself. In his first games in six months, without his friend and mentor in his corner, Bismond felt helpless, and it showed. He decided to absent-mindedly duel Janush, a master logician in a game of logic allowing Janush to easily destroy him in games 1, 2, and 3. So Bismond decided he needed a game plan, and after hours of analysis of Janush's games, he found that despite his genius and logic, 
Janusha's moves weren't exactly imaginative. So Bismond concluded that in order to have a chance at winning, he'd have to throw the book out the window and play creative moves, which Janusz couldn't react to. And it worked when in game four, Bismond set up this position, then moved his rook here, a wild, imaginative move that made the crowd roar and resulted in check after check after check until a surprise Janusz finally resigned the game. When Janusz mercilessly defeated him in the first game, Bismond felt betrayed. But now, he understood what his great mentor had been trying to teach him. He had relied for so long on Janusz's deductive abilities that he had forgotten his own instinct. So when he relearned that instinct, he defeated Janusz in games 5, 6, and 7, confirming to Bismond his final lesson. In order to be a truly great leader and a great man, one must not stand behind logic and formula, but instead walk bravely into the untried, untested places of the imagination. So, in game 8, when confronted with this position, a losing position, and every single logical bone in his body told him to move his horse here, Bismon simply smiled, pushing his rook here. At first, this move looked like a terrible blunder, and the crowd howled accordingly, but Bismon was still walking and was confident that he had just won the game. And in four more moves, the crowd's howls turned to cheers as he masterfully showed them he had. In that moment, Bismond locked eyes with his friend, who simply bowed his head and said, in Punjabi, I resign, my sultan. And thus, the two of them finished what is considered by many the greatest game of the World Chess Tournament, and Bismond learned his final lesson. Now, he came to truly believe that he was Sultan, no matter if he held the title or not. And this was a confidence he carried into the final set of the tournament against Baltazar Costa, the 15-year-old slave who had checkmated him so long ago. After he defeated Bismond, Balthazar went on a tear through the rabble, proving to all that he had more than enough talent to stand with the masters. His skill was enough to carry him into the bracket alone and get picked up by his own Shah smoker, named Menander, who gave him a moral test very similar to what Janusz had given Bismond. So, with his natural talent and the genius Menander at his side to clean up any gaps in his play, between July and December, Balthazar lost zero games, proving that not only was he great, but he may well have been the greatest of all time. So, in the final set, to the surprise of no one, he completely destroyed Bismon, winning four games in a row and putting him in an unwinnable position in the final. But just as everyone was prepared to write Bismon off as the loser, he completely shocked the world by winning it all. After all these months and everything they had gone through, it all came down to a simple question from Bismond, do you wish to be sultan? These words, which looked simple on paper, carried with them such conviction that Balthazar was forced to respond with the truth. I do not know. So Bismond pressed him, you must know. Look around you. You sit here upon a stage before thousands. But should you defeat me, for the rest of your life, 
you will sit upon a stage before hundreds of millions, with your every decision shaping the future of all humanity. So I ask you again, do you wish to be Sultan? And Balthazar replied, I wish only to play chess. So Bismon gave him a choice. Defeat me now, and you shall never play chess as you have again. But resign, and you shall be named Chess Master of the World, and shall play for as long as you live. And thus, with tears in his eyes, Balthazar resigned the set. And as Bismon rose from his seat on shaky legs, he was formally proclaimed ruler of the world. After a great festival, which roared across the city, lasting an entire week, a newly dressed Bismon was led to the final ceremony, where he met the Weishas, or dictator, of the Rikishi Star Empire. There, the Rikish Regency was ended, as Bismon was named Sultan of Earth and ruler of the Talgadi, which was explained to mean great men in Rikishi. Then he was offered his single wish for anything in the universe. And with the immaturity of a 19-year-old and a great passion for birds, Bismon wished for the most beautiful falcon in all the universe. So the Rikish made appear atop Bismond's turban, a huge rainbow falcon from the iridescent mountain peaks of the planet Babu, which he named Alakazam, derived from al Qasam, the oath. But he wouldn't have long to enjoy his rule before, just as the Rikish left for home, Letters arrived from four corners of the earth, announcing revolt. The Great Chess Rebellion had begun. Immediately, the multicultural standing armies which the Rakish had established during the Rakish Regency were put to the test, with Bismon taking personal control of the Chinese front the most dangerous front of the war. There, the incredible work ethic he had built during the chess tournament served him well in the chess rebellion, when he hardly left his saddle, hardly ate, and hardly slept, but still, to the surprise of his generals, kept a watchful eye over his armies. And with the half-sentient Alakazam scouting high above the land, he kept a watchful eye over the enemy armies as well. And with this great advantage, in 1606, after five years of non-stop war, Bismond masterfully ambushed its final rebellious army in Tunshang Valley. And as the Lashar cannons tore into the huge Chinese column, Bismond gave the order to not stop firing until every single rebel was reduced to smoking ash. This was dubbed the Battle of the Fall of Cherry Fire. And after the dust cleared and the valley was revealed to have been stripped of all life, Bismon knew the Great Chess Rebellion was over and rode for home. But on the way, in 1607, he stopped in Damascus and married the eldest daughter of Beni Wadid, whom he had been in love with since he was a boy. Then he finished his journey to Cairo, his empire's capital, and took the throne back from Janush, whom he had appointed Grand Vizier of Earth. Then, using Rikishi building techniques, 
Bismond began construction of the colossal Yargon Fortress, which would take eight years to complete. In the meantime, he lived in a nice palace along the Nile, where he built his family. Despite being 20 years his senior and quickly approaching menopause, Bismond's wife, Anissa, still gave him three children. And here was where Bismond developed the naming conventions which would be used for all of them. In many Muslim territories, Imams were already beginning to compare Bisman to the Prophet Muhammad himself. So, feeling guilt at the comparison, he decided to take the old Muslim saying, if you have a hundred sons, name them all Muhammad, literally, vowing to name every son he would ever have Muhammad, and every daughter after Muhammad's wives. So, in 1611, at the circumcision festival of his first son, Muhammad Janush, Bismond made it clear that no name would be more revered in his empire. But in a pause between sentences, a booming voice rose from the crowd, interrupting Bismond. And out of it stepped an elderly African who dressed in an exotic style and spoke in Arabic so accented and filled with alien words that it was nearly incomprehensible. I am Omsa, he said. A man of your world, but not from it. Of a race lifted from your Africa eons ago to feast in great halls many zizmids beyond your skies. I come to warn you of the Zivog, the snakes, who no doubt have named you Talgod and lie when you ask its meaning. Talgod truly means ignorant or blind, for the Zivog regard you as little more than cattle, to be fed shas and consumed. Look to your shas walkers, your oracles, and once they hear the final whimpers of the thousands of races who have come before us, you shall know I speak the truth. It's said that Omsa yelled so loudly that he spat blood as he fought Bismond's guards to finish his speech before he was hauled away to the dungeons. But before Bismond could interrogate Omsa further, the Rakish caught wind of his speech, ordering the Sultan, under threat of economic sanctions against Earth, to make what he believed was one of the greatest mistakes of his reign. On May 10th, he gave the order to have Omsa beheaded. And despite Bismond's feelings, the case was officially considered closed. But that didn't sit well with Janush, who looked deep inside himself for the truth. And what he found made him become disillusioned with life, neglecting his duties as Grand Vizier and allowing the Empire to flounder. It got so bad that in late 1611, Bismond was forced to hold a private meeting with Janush. And there, at the brink of tears, Janush explained that at Omsa's words, he had shas walked further than any human ever had. And just outside humanity's range of vision, he was shown thousands of dead worlds who were once host to thousands more great civilizations. And as Janush listened closely, he could hear the final helpless cries of those civilizations' children as they were consumed by the Rakish. Then, when he finished his account and wiped his eyes, Janush asked, What do we do? And with a face as still as stone, Bismond replied, We rebel. In 1612, Janush resigned as Grand Vizier and disappeared 
and Bismond began the arduous task of making it appear to the Rakish that, as he grew older, he grew more stupid and spineless. And it worked. As the weaker Bismond looked, the more wealth and power the Rakish gave him, which he quietly funneled into a secret council he called the Diamond Council. Composed of just 20 members whom Bismond could trust with his life, the Diamond Council was built to develop the steps required for a successful rebellion against the Rakish. And after seven years, those steps were complete. Step one was to gather information, a wealth of it, which couldn't possibly be acquired without supernatural means. So in 1612, a small group of Shah's smokers, led by Menander, was established to learn the sciences of the universe. Step two was to build 20 starships and sets of five in four hidden locations, as per Menander's specifications, so they could resist the wares and tears of space. This step was begun in 1612 and wouldn't finish until 1618. Step three was to provide these colossal starships with colossal crews, Shaw smokers to pilot them, and great men to captain them. This step was complete by May 1618, as every starship was built, crewed, armed, and made ready for war. And so, with all the preparations complete, step four was to meet with Janush, which in July 1618, Bismond did personally, traveling in disguise to Janush's temple in the Himalayas, where the two men finally met after six years spent apart. And there, when asked what the next step should be, Janush, with cold eyes that bore a thousand years of newfound wisdom, simply said, Bring the snakes to Sul. So when Bismond returned to Cairo, he ordered the Diamond Council to carry out Step 5, sending the starships to space and dividing them into four squadrons to be sent to the four neighboring stars of Sul. Bismond's plan was this. If these squadrons caused enough commotion at the neighboring stars, they'd look like small lances of a much larger fleet. And if they were able to destroy just a single Rakish starship, the Rakish Empire would have no choice but to respond with a great fleet of their own. Bismond could think of no better way to bring the snakes to Sul than this. And so, on August 3rd, 1618, the 20 starships were lifted and divided, and around each of them was formed a great Shah's hive, which when masterfully controlled by the Shah's smoker within, would provide oxygen, gravity, warmth, and propulsion to the otherwise useless wooden shell. And with the power of Shas, the incredible distances between Sul and its surrounding stars could be covered within days. So, in the early morning of August 5th, the 3rd Squadron, under Garshab al-Baghdadi, arrived in Lakuta and was destroyed. On August 6th, the 2nd Squadron, under Nandu Khan, arrived in Sira and was destroyed as well. And late in that same day, the 4th Squadron, under Kim Min Su, arrived in Al-Hazara and was atomized before they could fire a single shot. So, that left the 1st Squadron, with the Sultan's flagship, the Alakazam, at its head under the command of the Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus, with Menander as his Shah's smoker. On August 7th, the first squadron entered Zalaman, 
and fought a battle so legendary as to be considered holy. As at the loss of four starships, Gustavus and Menander were able to destroy two Rakesh battleships, which heavily outgunned them. Then, on August 9th, as the Alakazam, the sole surviving starship of the First Fleet, limped back to Earth, Bismon knew of the victory, and knew that soon the Grand Fleet of the Rikishi Star Empire would be at Earth's doorstep. Now, he began step six, wait and hope that Janush would pull through. And so, as Bismon anxiously paced the halls of the Yargon Fortress, halfway across the world, Janush steeled himself to do the thing he had prepared for for the last seven years, end the Rakish. On September 1st, the Grand Rikishi Fleet, numbering some 1,000 starships, arrived in orbit above the Earth, intending to destroy it. But as they entered the outer bounds of the solar system and made a great ripple in the Shas network, Janush already knew. As they passed the Black World, Janush began a death prayer for he did not intend to survive what he was about to do. As they passed the deep blue world, he began meditative breathing to prepare his will. As they passed Almarik, he ordered his disciples to unveil Blahaga, a 30-foot Shas Bong. And as they came into orbit, Janush tapped into the Shas that whirled inside their bodies and gave the signal for his disciples to light it. So as the first Rikishi bombs fell upon the great cities of the world, Janush sucked down 30 feet of Shas, and as his lungs stretched to the point of agony, he gave a final pull, and they exploded, sending the Shas deep within his body, to make love to his soul. And as pain dueled with pleasure inside him, he fell into the abyss. And thereafter, he awoke in a huge Stygian hall, the Hall of Civilizations, where along each wall, millions of candles marked the magnificence of all the civilizations of the universe. And at one end, there burned, brighter than all, the candle of the Rakish. With the last ounce of his strength, Janush crossed the hall and collapsed at its base. And as the life drained from his body, he willed himself to rise. And with the stardust of his soul, he blew it out. In an instant, the Rikishi Star Empire, which had spanned the galaxy and lasted for millions of years, was plucked from existence, and its candle would never burn again. Hey, what's up, you guys? Join the Hello Fellow Discord and be ready for part two.